Adams State College. Great stories begin here. Thank you all for being here. All right, the year is 1970. The place is Wilson Elementary School, located in a working class neighborhood of Wichita, Kansas, known as South City. I'm five years old and a kindergartner, and I don't know it at the time, but my life is about to change forever. I'm John Taylor, and the title of my lecture is, my last lecture is Acting Heroic, Lessons from a Life in the Theater. And tonight, I'm going to share with you the three big picture ideas that I've learned as a student and a teacher while living a life in the theater. So back to that classroom, 1970. Uh, something happened in that classroom that led to the first big picture idea that I learned in life. First year kindergarten teacher, I still remember clearly, Mrs. Conyers, decided that she wanted to direct and produce a Christmas play with her kindergarten class. Now this was 1970, remember, so it wasn't just a generic Christmas play. We were going to do the Christmas play. <laughs> I wanted to be Joseph. I really wanted to be Joseph. I was told I was too short to be Joseph. <laughs> So instead, I was cast in the pivotal role of the Star of Bethlehem, <laughs> which involved a dowel rod, construction paper, and a lot of glitter. So uh, we rehearsed our play for a couple of weeks. And then on the day of the performance, we transformed our classroom into a theater. We moved all the desks to the side of the room. We established the stage at the front of the classroom, in front of the chalkboard. We made the middle of the room the audience space. And throughout the day, different classes made their way in to see our production 
of the birth of Christ. Well, the first group in were, were the sixth graders. And they filed into the classroom and they filled the middle of the room where our desks used to be. The action of the play took place in front of the chalkboard at the front of the class. So you're where the sixth graders are. And I waited my entrance at the back of the classroom, waiting to come in with, as a star of Beth, carrying my stick. That's ba basically what I did. Um, <laughs> and so as the play began, all of a sudden it, it occurred to me that we have a problem here, one that we didn't anticipate and one that we didn't rehearse. Because as I looked at my fellow actors up in front, I realized I was having trouble seeing them because there were a group of big sixth graders in my way. I wasn't sure how I was going to go from the back of the room and make it to the stage. We, we hadn't rehearsed that part with an audience involved, with an audience there in the middle. And all of a sudden, I heard my cue. And I had to start moving. So I have my stick in hand, and I'm moving. And I'm moving it closer and closer to the back of the sixth grade class, not knowing how I was going to make my way through them. They were unaware that I was even there. And then finally, I get to the back of the last row of sixth graders, standing there waiting to get to the stage somehow. And then a really cool thing happened. As if the sixth graders were the Red Sea themselves, <laughs> they parted. And I walked through with that stick and star and glitter in hand. And I'll tell you, I didn't feel afraid. I wasn't nervous. I felt. I felt at home. I felt like I had found, even at the age of five, where I belonged in this world. And I, and I think strongly that that was the moment that I fell in love with theater. And then, of course, I went on to do other productions. Uh, the one right after that, uh, there was a historical recreation of the wedding of Tom Thumb. This time, my height worked for me. <laughs> I was Tom Thumb, the lead role. And then I have spent the last 40 years involved in theater. And as I think back to that moment, what was it about that moment that so clicked for me that I fell in love with theater, that on some level that I wasn't able to articulate at that time, that I had found what I wanted to do in life? And I never have really wavered. Ted, there was one moment uh, when I started um, college that I thought theater wasn't important enough and I signed on as a social work major. Then that lasted about a week, and then I realized <laughs> that the theater was where I was supposed to be. So what was it about that moment? And as I think back upon it, I think in part it has to do with the way I look at theater, and in fact the way that I define acting. And some of you who are in my acting class or were in my acting class will recognize this definition, that I argue that acting is really a sharing of energy. A sharing of energy between actors on stage, a sharing of energy between actors and audience. And this sharing goes on until a kind of electricity is created. Something you can't see, but you can feel as this connection between human beings occurs as we go on a mutual journey through a story for a couple of hours together. And as I walk through that crowd, those sixth graders, I don't know if anybody else felt. I felt it. I felt that sense of energy in the air, and I was addicted to it. And I wanted more of it, this sense of connection to other people and telling a story and sharing that story. So as I look at that moment, then I began to think of other things, big picture ideas. If theater is a metaphor for life, then I would argue also that life is a sharing of energy. And at some point, I hope that each of us in our lives ask the very basic question, how do I share energy? Do I give my energy freely and fully, sharing the best of myself? Or do I hold back and conserve and withdraw, fearing that the more I share with other people, the less I'll have for myself? Not realizing that the more we share the best of ourselves with others, the more we'll get back in turn and the more energy we will have for ourselves. Or, in worst case situations, do we choose to share the worst of ourselves? Really, the choice of our, is ours, and I think to a large degree, how we answer that question. How do we choose to share our energy, the best of ourselves or the worst of ourselves, will determine to a large degree the kind of life we end up leading. So out of that classroom, I not only found a love for theater, 
but I learned my first big picture lesson. Life is a sharing of energy and how we choose to share who we are with others and with what we're doing will determine to a large degree the kind of life we lead. So I, I, I went from there, continued to do more theater, but along the way I found something that I loved even more. And that was the idea of teaching. So I enrolled at Wichita State University in Wichita, Kansas as a theater secondary ed major. And in my first semester of my sophomore year, I'm convinced that I learned the most important thing I've ever learned in 11 years of college, from undergraduate through graduate school. It was a history and philosophy class of education, a history and philosophy of education class taught by a man named Dr. Lewis Goldman. And in this class one evening, Dr. Goldman talked and shared about the writer Homer. And he talked about Homer's heroic ideal, looking at Homer's stories. What made his characters heroic? And actually, it's a pretty good question to discuss because if you read Homer's stories, his characters go on great adventures, they challenge the gods, and all, but they don't always succeed. Sometimes and oftentimes, they lose. So how can you be heroic if you've lost? Well, Dr. Goldman explained to us, it is not winning that made them successful. It was the very fact that they faced their fears and challenged their limitations, sought to go beyond their own self-perceived limitations in life by setting off on a quest in which they knew not how it would end or whether they would be successful or not, but the very fact that they faced their fears and challenged their limitations and expanded their opportunities made them heroic. Now, you know, on a personal level, I relate to this by thinking back to when we first moved to Alamosa. Our daughter, Kate, who's in the audience back there, uh, and probably just hated that I just identified that <laughs> she's in the audience, was four years old. And we went to City Park, and she wanted to climb the monkey bars. So I lifted her up. She hung on the first bar, reached for the second, reached for the third. And as she did that, she failed, fell to her knees and scraped them up terribly. I mean, she was crying. It was an awful situation. We just went and got ice cream. Forget the monkey bars. That was, that was the solution. But it took months, months before she was willing and ready to go back and try the monkey bars. So we went back to the park, the same place earlier where she fell and hurt herself. I lifted her up. She held on to the first bar, reached for the second, reached for the third, reached for the fourth. And as she went for the fifth, she fell. She dropped back on her feet. Now, on one level, you could argue that she didn't successfully complete crossing the monkey bars. But from a different perspective, I would argue that she was heroic in that moment because she faced her fears without knowing whether or not she was going to be successful. And in making it, and just challenging herself, her limitations, her self perceived limitations, facing her fears, she was heroic in that moment. And as Dr. Goldman explained, it's not just about one person being heroic, but as we watch somebody try something that they don't know if they can do or not, they face a fear, we are all made heroic by that moment. Because we think, if, if my daughter can do that, face her fear, what in my own life am I avoiding facing? Or, or if you think on a bigger scale, Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, no guarantee of success when he did that. But in doing it, he was successful, but he was also heroic. Not just because he did something that, that he was successful at doing, but because in that moment, he redefined what it is to be a human being. He redefined for all time what it is to be a human being. Once he did that, we are no longer limited to Earth. What it means to be a human being and our possibilities are forever expanded by that moment in time. This lesson that we learned from Dr. Goldman changed forever how I think about success and failure. In life, in the classroom, in productions, in whatever I do, that success isn't always about winning. It's about seeking to go beyond what you thought you could do. In truth, I think that that's what teaching is really about, daring our students to be heroic to go beyond their fears and their self-perceived limitations and seek to expand the boundaries of their opportunities, daring our students to be 
heroic. And when we do that, the possibilities are not only great for that person, but for all of us. It was an incredible lesson to learn from a very wise man. And it's a lesson that I teach when I teach my REAP class for people going into elementary school teaching. Success isn't about winning or losing, ultimately. It's about striving to make yourself better than you are today. That's what I learned, and that was an important lesson. So I go through my education courses. I get to uh, the student teaching semester of my uh, student career, and I have an epiphany. I realize that I don't want to teach at the secondary level. <laughs> So I don't. I, I don't even do the student teaching semester. I realize, I, particularly what I'm going into theater in an era, this, was, this would be in 1988. Uh, there were budget cuts, as there are budget cuts over and over again in the arts. It wasn't exactly a promising career to go into. And I realized that I would probably be happier teaching at the college level. So I enroll, or I apply to graduate schools. And I'm accepted at The Ohio State University, where I uh, enroll and I pursue a master's degree and then a, a, then a doctoral degree. And it's at Ohio State University that I learned my third big picture idea in life. Um, and I learned it on the same day that's one of the three happiest days of my life. It's the day that I earned my doctoral degree, the graduation ceremony. I look at that day. I look at the day that Christine and I were married nearly 20 years ago this December, and I look at the day 15 and a half years ago when Kate was born as the three happiest days of my life. And there's one common denominator for each of those events, and that's Christine. And without her, I, anything that I've accomplished, I wouldn't have. And without Christine and Kate, anything that I've accomplished wouldn't have been worth it. So thank you, Christine and Kate. So on that day at graduation, the big lesson I learned Ohio State does things in a big way, always. Not only football is big, but graduation is big. I didn't graduate in the spring, which would have meant sitting out in the football stadium with thousands of people. I graduated in the summer with about five or 6,000 other people graduating. Um, when you graduated at Ohio State, everybody crosses the stage, and everybody receives their actual diploma as you cross the stage. That's a big feat to accomplish with that many people. It's all about precision and timing and everyone being where they're supposed to be. So picture this graduation day. We're in the big basketball arena, Schottenstein Center, and I'm in my row with the other people getting their doctoral degrees, and there are literally hundreds of us. And our row, it's time for us to get up. We move towards the stage, but before we get to the stage, there's a wonderful little ceremony that happens. You, you, you move off from your group, and you go and find your advisor, your mentor who's been working with you. And you find that mentor, and you meet him or her, and you get hooded. So the doctoral hood is the thing that we wear over, over our gowns, and that moment is the moment when you receive it. So I found my advisor, Dr. Alan Woods, the wisest man I've ever met in my life, and he has shown my family and I so many kindnesses through the years. I'm forever indebted to him. So I, I, I go to Alan, I shake his hand, I turn my back to him, he places the doctoral hood over me. I mean, this is an emotional moment. My family are in the stands, and as I'm getting the doctoral hood put over me, I, I'm waiting, anticipating when I turn back what he's going to say to me. This is a man I had known for six years, the words of wisdom. I mean, this is the wisest man I've known. I knew he was going to say something as he sends his student off into the world. I turn, shake hands. Wait, I look in his eyes, and what does he say? He says, get back in line, or you'll screw everything up. <laughs> <laughs> so we laugh. I mean, I laugh. I know what he, I mean, he was right. We couldn't chat, because if I, if I was out of line, I was going to get the wrong diploma, somebody else. I mean, the whole domino effect would happen. <laughs> so I get back in line. But later, I, I, I choose to re reimagine that moment in a different way. Uh, I, I'm, I think Alan was really not, he was not really telling me that life is about following the rules and doing what people expect you to do or else you'll get in trouble and mess things up. I think instead what he was really saying to me was, be where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to do, and everything will work out. 
And that was great advice, actually, for me as I began then, after graduation, to apply for teaching jobs. And this was 1994 when I graduated with my doctoral degree. It was a tough market to graduate in. To find a job, particularly in theater and higher education, was hard. There was a whole generation of professors who had yet to retire. And we were waiting for them to retire, <laughs> as well as the economy. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Dan. Um, young professors, thank you everywhere. I would send out applications, and I would get back letters saying, a hundred other people apply for this, or two hundred other people applied for this one position. Luckily, um, something happened that was to my benefit while riding out a tough job market. I was hired to be the assistant to the, and to the director and curator of the Lawrence and Lee Theater Research Institute at Ohio State University. It's one of three or four archival theater research institutes in the country. I had a great position. I was working with my old mentor again, Dr. Woods. It was a great job. I met lots of famous people from Barishnikov to Twyla Tharp to Richard Lewis, the comedian. I handled Cab Calloway's costume that he wore in Porgy and Bess. I got to see private drawings from the great uh, composer Harold Arland who wrote Somewhere Over the Rainbow. I mean, it was just an incredible job. But along the way, I knew that it wasn't where I was supposed to be doing what I was supposed to do. I wasn't yet ready, and I'm still not ready, to be an administrator. I, I, I wanted to be and needed to be in the classroom. But there weren't the jobs coming. So I took a variety of jobs in the evening as an adjunct instructor, teaching at community colleges, because I wanted the experience. I wanted to learn how to be a better teacher. I applied and I applied. I was offered a job in Texas. I turned down the job in Texas what? because it was Texas. <laughs> um, <laughs> it wasn't just that. It didn't, it, wasn't, it didn't feel like the right place for me to be at the right time. That wasn't where I was supposed to be. And then in 1999, I applied for a job at a little place I'd never heard of called Adams State College. <laughs> I remember actually sitting in at my, at my computer and thinking, I'm not going to do this. I'm just not going to do that. I, I thought, no, it's not, it's not going to happen, so I'm not going to apply. And some, uh, but something told me, apply. And I did. And I was interviewed. And I was brought out for an interview. I, was done, I did a phone interview. I was brought out for an interview. Then I was offered the job. And I took it. Because I f it felt like this was where I was supposed to be doing what I was supposed to do. And I had said all along, from the very first day in graduate school, that my career goal was to teach in a smaller college where I could get to know my students, they could get to know me, and I could have an impact on their lives, and, and hopefully an impact on the community. This was the job for me. Took it. So Christine and I and Kate, we packed up our stuff, moving from Columbus, Ohio, a city of a million plus people, <laughs> to Alamosa, a city of 8,000. We, uh, we, we rented a house sight on scene from a realtor. And, and it was a four bedroom house, like four sixty five a month. It was a great deal, two car garage. Uh, the realtor told me that it was on a cul-de-sac. Uh, it was in an area that was slightly commercial. But, so we pictured grass and kids playing and our daughter was just four years old, perfect environment. We, we finally get here, we finally find it. I'm driving in one car with the goldfish and the dogs, Christine's in the other car with Kate. And we finally find this place, and it turns out we find ourselves behind Kmart <laughs> in one of those two houses located between Sears and what is now the Red Cross. <laughs> Let me recreate that moment for you. <laughs> we get out of the car. I'm thinking, oh my god, we're not going to stay, are we? And Christine. Christine gets out of the car, and her first words from her mouth were, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> I'm not sure whether there were tears or not, but, uh, but we stayed. We lived in that house for a year until we found our own house that we bought. But we immediately made Alamosa our home. It felt like the right place, the right place to be and where we should be. The college felt like the right place and where we should be. And so as I took this job at Adams, I promised myself that I wouldn't miss an opportunity. This 
I've been waiting. I graduated with my doctoral degree in 1994. This was 1999. It was about four and a half years that I was patient. I have people telling me, get your Master of Library Sciences degree so you can uh, be faculty at Ohio State with your job at the Research Institute. Go teach high school. And thing, but I knew that if I just waited to know where I was supposed to be, doing what I was supposed to be, it would work out. And I promised myself I had waited this long that I wasn't going to hold back when I got here. I was going to try to be the kind of teacher that I had dreamed of being uh, and do the things that I wanted to do in the ways that I wanted to do them. And I also promised myself this, or I told myself this, that I was 34 years old, but I have 30 years to teach at least. At that time, I thought 30 years is not going to be enough. Uh, and I worried about it not being long enough. But I said, I have 30 years, and that will be my sign of success. That will be my standard of success as a teacher. Three decades of impacting students' lives who then would go on in their own jobs and careers and lives and impact others. That would be my legacy. That would be my legacy would be longevity. 30 years if, they were, if I was lucky enough that they retained me and, and I got tenure, this would be my sign of success. And as we went along, things were going well. I'm tenured, and I got full professor. Uh, in 2006, I directed It's a Wonderful Life as our holiday production that year. And I remember thinking, uh, Sandy Weehy gave me a sign that said, It's a Wonderful Life, and I, had it, I have it in my house, now in my office. I remember looking at that sign thinking, it really is a wonderful life. And then the split second later, I thought, be careful. <laughs> be careful. You never know what's going to happen next. One of my favorite words, my, my favorite word actually of all time, is the word aporia, A-P-O-R-I-A. -O -O it's a Greek word. It means gap or contradiction. I use it a lot in my dramatic literature courses. I, I talk about moments of aporia, and this is how I define it. A moment of aporia is when what we believe to be true is contradicted by what we've seen or what we experience. I hope that most theater performances are moments of aporia for our audience. I think life is full of moments of aporia for us. That what we believe to be true runs smack dab into, is contradicted by something we see or something we experience. And then somehow we have to reconcile what we once knew to be true and what we've now just experienced. In 2007, I experienced a major moment of aporia that would change my life forever. Let me get a drink. In 2007, in February, I woke up one morning, and it was as if my body was split in half. The right side felt like it had a heating pad on it. The left side felt like an ice pack was on it, from foot to head. I got to tell you, sitting down, it was a weird experience. <laughs> And that went on for days, and so I finally saw my doctor and was diagnosed with a pinched nerve. And I thought, okay, that's fine, we'll just ride it out. And it started to get better. Then a month later, in March of 2007, I woke up, and my feet felt like they were asleep, only it didn't go away. It just didn't go away. And then a couple of days later, that, that feeling of being numb or, or tingling or asleep moved up to here, and then gradually, by the time that I walked in graduation in May of 2007, that my whole body from my feet to here felt like it was asleep. And so um, my doctor sent me to see a neurologist, uh, Dr. Patrick Sternberg, uh, and uh, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, MS. Um, in that drive back from Dr. Sternberg's office in La Vida, uh, Christine and I pulled over to the side of the road going across the La Vida Pass. We looked at each other. We cried for a little bit. We worried about my health. We worried about the health of our family. I worried about my ability to continue to teach. I'm not the, the smartest professor out there, but the one thing I feel like I bring to the classroom is a sense of energy and enthusiasm and passion. At that time, I had very little feeling in my body, and my energy was completely gone. And I remember telling Christine, if, if this doesn't change, I don't know how I can continue to teach. And it concerned me that I wouldn't be able to be the kind of teacher I promised myself that I wanted to be. Luckily for us, uh, luckily for me, in fact, with, you know, the Fahrenheit 451 project was coming along. I was planning it, getting ready to implement it, 
it was one of the most um, important moments in my, in my professional career, one of the most exciting moments that year when we did that project from uh, October 2007 till May 2008. And I'm thankful for that moment because it kept me preoccupied, not worrying about this thing that I was dealing with. But on a personal level, it was probably the most difficult year that I've ever experienced. Uh, I would go through uh, moments of exacerbations, which made movement at times difficult to do. Uh, I finally told my theater students, because I didn't want them to think that I was drinking before I came to class, you know. So, uh, but I was dealing with it, and the Fahrenheit Project kept me focused on something really, really positive. And then in March of 2008, as I was in rehearsals for Fahrenheit 451, our stage production, I woke up one Sunday night with an excruciating pain in my left eye, so bad that if I could have taken out my eye, I would have done that. Uh, I went finally to the emergency room, uh, and I'm very grateful for Dr. Sternberg letting me call him at five in the morning, and we got the pain stopped. But then I was re-diagnosed um, based upon those new symptoms. Uh, what I got for literature to read about this uh, was no longer MS, but a, uh, something known as neuromyelitis optica, or NMO, or Devix disease. And what the material, which there's not a lot out there, there's getting more and more. It says it's a rare, life-threatening, inflammatory, demyelinating disorder, usually relapsing, that targets the optic nerves and spinal cord, resulting in attack-related accrual of disability. Compared with typical multiple sclerosis, NMO is more rapidly disabling. 50% of patients must use a wheelchair, and 62% become functionally blind at five years. Now, some of those statistics are changing because there are starting to be some new ways of dealing with it. But you've got to understand, this was a devastating, devastating diagnosis. Um, and I had to refigure out, I had to figure out where I go from here. I mean, I had set as one standard for my success as longevity. And it really occurred to me that maybe longevity wasn't in the cards for me. Maybe it is, maybe, I mean, we all don't know how long we have, but it, sometimes we get, you know, a concrete reminder that we don't always have longevity. So if I set longevity as the standard for my success, what if that doesn't happen? Do I look back and say, I wasn't success? And so I realized at that moment it was time for the teacher to go back and see what kind of student I was. Could, did I really learn those three big picture ideas? And could I actually apply them? So as I went through this process of, of dealing with this, I tried to figure out, for me, what is, on a professional level, success? And I looked back to those three big ideas. And for, this is what I came up with. My success will be based upon being where I'm supposed to be, doing what I'm supposed to do, which I believe strongly it's here. As long as you'll have me, I will be here working in the theater and trying to bring quality productions and quality work in the classroom. It will also mean sharing fully my energy, giving the best of myself for as long as I can. And I think that'll be a long time. And it means dealing with and facing whatever challenges and limitations come my way. Those will be my successes, defining on my terms my success. I hope you will remember these three big picture ideas and find them useful. Be where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to do. And only your heart and mind can tell you what that's going to be. And as you're doing what you're supposed to do, share your energy fully, giving the best of yourself to the people around you and to what you're doing. And as you face challenges, and you will, and as obstacles get in your way, and they will, and as life brings you the unexpected, and it will, Choose your own success. Define your own success by seeking, to expand your, by seeking to confront your limitations, face your fears, and expand the boundaries of your opportunities. If you do these things, I believe that you'll be able to look back at your life and say, I was successful, and moreover, I was heroic. Thank you so much for listening. Lecture over.
so much. All right, uh, before I begin this formal introduction of um, Dr. Marty Jones, I just want to say that um, both he and um, Dr. Taylor are so um, the epitome of the faculty here at Adams State because of their love of their profession and um, just great people to know. Okay, let's do this day because I'm ready. Dr. Jones is a native Kansan who earned his BS in chemistry at Emporia State University. <laughs> We're both Kansans. Oh, yeah. He fell in love with the mountains and deserts of the Southwest while pursuing his PhD at the University of New Mexico. After 10 years in the Midwest, postdoc at the University of Minnesota, or Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and assistant associate professor at University of North Dakota, he found his way back to the Southwest at Adams State College, where he's been a professor for 21 years. Despite his age, <laughs> he continues to be interested in innovative pedagogical approaches that generate interest in chemistry among his students. This has included the development of weekly chemistry in the real world, molecule of the week, and now Green Friday presentations in classes, as well as significant use of computer-based molecular modeling and technical writing. When not involved with school-related activities, he enjoys bicycling, we all see him around bicycling, fishing, hiking, camping, music, and reading. Thank you, Linda. John's going to be a really tough act to follow. <laughs> I want to thank you for coming back because after listening to John, I think you probably heard as much as you really needed to hear tonight. And I wouldn't have blamed you if you had just taken off and, and gone about the rest of your lives. Um, <laughs> well, really, I, 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 I am going to follow some of John's advice. He said, make sure you have a cup of water handy so you can take a drink every now and again when you're throat starts to get dry. I'm going to steal some of his material. I did ask him first if it was going to be okay to do that because I am definitely facing a fear right now. <laughs> <laughs> I've never talked in front of a group this large before. And even when I was at North Dakota, well, I mean, it was a different audience at North Dakota because it was just students, not community members and so on. So bear with me as we go through this and I try to share with you some things that I learned without going to kindergarten. And perhaps the best way to start is by sharing with you things that you probably all did learn in kindergarten. I stole the title, I guess, borrowed the title maybe as a better term, from this book by Robert Fulgham. And I'm not going to read through these, but these are some pretty good rules to live by if you can clean up your own mess. We try to get our students in the chemistry labs to do that, and by golly, they're pretty darn good about that. Um, I wish that I could follow this one, <laughs> but, <coughs> but it just doesn't work out that that's very possible given, given what we do. So why, why did I choose this? When I was five years old in 1957, interesting that both John and I are starting with five years old. But unlike John, the town that I lived in, Everest, Kansas, here's a, a Google Earth <laughs> picture of it. This is the entirety of Everest, Kansas. In 1957, 1960, I think there were something around 450 to 500 people in that town. And there was a an elementary school and a high school. At that time, at least in Everest, there was no middle school. So you went in elementary school from first grade to eighth grade because there was no kindergarten. So I didn't get a chance to learn any of the rules <laughs> from Fulgham until I started first grade. And I think we probably learned those in first grade with Mrs. Mann. Um, most of them anyway, I suspect. Right now, Everest is like many other small towns in Kansas and across the Midwest, population is declining. The, 19, the 2010 census is estimating the population at about 314. So it's dropped quite a bit. There's only one school left in Kansas, the, the middle school. 
the other schools have all been consolidated. There's a high school in some other town. There's a grade school in some other town. And Everest is, is pretty much a, a dying town, or at least it's a decaying town. But at the time, we didn't have kindergarten. I didn't get a chance to learn those rules. And most of what I'm going to talk about now is things that I learned after high school. It's going to be a little bit of high school, um, mostly college, and things from beyond college. So let's get started with this. Now, the, the, uh, in the abstract that I provided to Linda for this presentation, I said I was going to be talking about four E's. And the first of these is enthuse, or enthusiasm, if you wish. When I was trying to get ready for this talk, I discovered that uh, the internet is a boundless source for quotations. So <laughs> here's one. Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm from Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, I really like this because I believe that you have to be enthusiastic about what you're doing. John mentioned the word enthusiasm and by all means, if you have never had a chance to interact with John, you may not know much about his enthusiasm. But I was fortunate enough to work with John on a course that we team taught, an enrichment course called Chemistry in the Theater. And so I got a chance firsthand to see just how enthusiastic he is and how he inspires his students with his enthusiasm as well. Um, one of the other reasons I chose this quote is because Ralph Waldo Emerson and I share the same birthday. <laughs> now, granted, his was a century or a century and a half before mine, but May 25th. He was born on May 25th. I was born on May 25th. I thought that was pretty nice. And this really embodies some of the things that I think we do well at Adams State. Uh, I like this one, too. If you aren't <laughs> fired with enthusiasm, you will be fired with enthusiasm. So probably most of us recognize this name as a coach or a former coach of the Green Bay Packers. Maybe you recognize it as the name of the Super Bowl trophy, the Lombardi trophy. At any rate, Lombardi, if you ever look at any old films, he was certainly enthusiastic about his players striding up and down the, the sidelines, uh, let's say encouraging his players rather than <laughs> berating them, but certainly enthusiastic. And this is something that I really believe we do well at Adams State. After all, wouldn't you rather, whether it's in a teaching situation or going to the grocery store, wouldn't you rather be greeted by someone who walked up and said, hello, is there something I can do to help you? Somebody who is enthusiastic instead of, yeah, here, I'll just scan your thing and now get out of my way. <laughs> Enthusiasm, I believe, is important in all avenues of life and certainly very important for uh, teaching. And since this is stories, everybody has a story to tell, here's my story that deals with enthusiasm. Uh, during my four years of high school, there were, always, there were two constants. Every year I took an English class. Every year I took a math class. And I got reasonably good at math, and I thought, my golly, when I go to college, I'm going to be a math major. And I did. I, I started off as a math major for one semester, maybe a semester and a half. My first calculus instructor did this. We dutifully wrote that down. <laughs> we wrote that down, too. And I never got the sense that he was particularly enamored of teaching <laughs> mathematics, <laughs> whether it be calculus or, or some other subject. So I started casting about for a different major. And I found in the <coughs> spring semester a trailer section of general chemistry and the teacher for that class, Mr. Bolin, was fired with enthusiasm. And he was able to share that enthusiasm with his students. Out of that class, I think half a dozen of us 
turned out to be chemistry majors and asked for Mr. Boline to be our advisor because he did such a good job of getting us enthused about the subject. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. If I had had, for my first semester of calculus, the instructor that I had for Calculus 3, I probably would have remained a math major because Dr. Bonner was just an outstanding mathematics professor. I really enjoyed that. But by that time, I was so far into my chemistry degree and really enjoyed that too that I decided I was just going to stick with chemistry. <coughs> okay. Second, engage. I want all my senses engaged. Let me absorb the world's variety and uniqueness. From Maya Angelou, the poet. So what does engage mean? From, a, from uh, the perspective of an instructor, engage to me means engaging your students in something that's going to get them excited about the subject matter. So here's something that we talk about in <laughs> a chemistry class. So C3H8, that's propane, plus oxygen in the presence of a spark generates CO2 and water, a combustion process. How many of you, and don't be shy about raising your hands, the camera will not catch your hand, believe me. <laughs> How many of you, when you saw that equation come across the board, thought to yourself, ah, oh, nuts. What are we getting ourselves into? <laughs> it's just going to be a chemistry talk. <laughs> Dang, yeah. I didn't see very many hands. I don't know if you're just shy or, <laughs> thank you, Jeff. Yeah. So what do we have to do to engage students? Well, until several years ago, here's what I probably would have done. You want combustion? I give you combustion. <laughs> so here's a propane torch. I can light this. And there we have combustion, right? So does this make it come home a little bit more, what combustion is? What? Where's the water? Where's the water? <laughs> Actually, there are some interesting things you can do. And Alan, if you just wait a minute, we'll <laughs> do that. Always good to have somebody who can anticipate what, what you want. But this is still just a demonstration. Did you guys do anything while I was lighting this propane torch? No. So how can we better engage the students? I mean, demonstrations are better than just a stand and deliver sort of presentation. But to truly engage the students, they need to do something. So you guys have candles. Some of you have candles anyway. You can, I don't want you to hold the candles in your hand. Please, that's what the brownie is for. <laughs> Stick the candle into the brownie. It's a fairly inexpensive candle holder. <laughs> well, it is compared to real candle holders. But what I'd like for you to do then is to go ahead and experience combustion yourself. So if you have matches somewhere, uh, and you may have to share matches, please light the candle. Please, please leave the candle unless you are allergic to, to flames or something. Leave, leave the candle going for a little while. And what you can do, yeah, the, the cup of water eventually you can use to put out. And please feel free to go ahead and take the candle home with you. Um, but, but as you do this, what you can see is the combustion process, right? So carbon dioxide is being produced, water vapor is being produced. Alan had a very good question, how, where's the water? You really can't see it because it's coming off as water vapor. 
can't really see the carbon dioxide either because it's coming off as CO2 gas, right? But there are experiments that can be done to demonstrate that a gas being produced is CO2 and that water vapor is being produced. We're not going to do that now because of some time limitations and certainly I didn't anticipate this many people. <laughs> <coughs> so, so what I need you to do now is just blow out the candle. Oh, oh, hey, did, the, did you, were you successful at getting the candle to blow out? What? How many people were not able to blow out the candle? Oh. So, oh, so this is a really interesting little trick, huh? Magic candles. So, if you want to engage the students, you can have a mixture. Some of the candles are just regular birthday candles. Some of them are these magic relighting candles. And to put those out, you need to dunk them in that little cup of water. Okay? So blow it out, quickly stick it into the cup of water. Then feel free again to take these candles home. But what you can do is talk with your students. Yeah, sorry, it's kind of smoky here now. But, but what you can do then, and now you can eat the brownies too, by the way. <coughs> but you can gather groups and students to discuss why the candle relit. What's different about the candle? And I'm not going to actually have you do that, but I can tell you that what, what's different about those candles, the magic relighting candles, is the wick. Because there are little bits of magnesium in the wick that will reignite with just the heat from the glowing wick when you first blow it out. So these are the kinds of things that we can do to engage our students. And here we have a quote that I hope embodies what, what we just experienced. I hear and I forget, unless you're only an auditory learner just by looking at the equation and hearing me read it to you, you may not have gotten much out of that. I see and I remember, well, you saw the propane torch, but hopefully now by actually doing the experiment and running the combustion, you learned something more and can relate more to the combustion process. Entertain. Whether we like it or not, as instructors at whatever level, instructors in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, giving a presentation to the Rotary Club, uh, whatever the instruction capacity is, we are in fact entertainers. Sometimes us grizzled old farts think that maybe we're turning more into entertainers or our students would like us to be more entertaining <laughs> than we really are. But so here's a quote. I'm going to let you read this and then we're going to have a little vote. <laughs> okay, has everybody had a chance to read through that? From whom did the quote come? Was it an entertainer or was it an educator? So how many, let's, let's just get a rough show of hands. How many believe that this was a quotation from an entertainer? How many believe that it was from an educator? Whoa. It was an entertainer. So I'm, I'm fond of telling the students in my class that my classroom is not a democracy, but rather a benevolent dictatorship. <laughs> they don't always agree with the benevolent part of that, by the way. But I, I bring this up because the majority was not correct. The majority felt that this was an educator when in fact it was an entertainer. 
I don't really like this quote. I would prefer to turn it around and say that we can do some education first. And along the way, if the students are entertained, maybe that will help them learn things better. So what can we do? Here's my story on this. About uh, eight, nine years ago now, uh, our chemistry program started teaching general chemistry using a book from the American Chemical Society, which has this illustration in it. And this is an illustration of a standing wave. When we talk about electrons having dual properties, both matter and wave characteristics, this is something that we use to talk about the wave characteristic of electrons. A standing wave is what we think of in quantum mechanical terms as an electron orbital. Okay, that's, what a, that's what an orbital is, a standing wave. Kind of hard to visualize that, though. So we look at an illustration of this sort, which is a standing wave of a string, a string that's fixed between two points. And we can have different amplitudes. We can have different frequencies and different wavelengths by changing the distance between those two fixed points. And so when you look at this, just at the diagram, is that pretty exciting? <laughs> is that pretty entertaining? No, not at all. So what you can do is bring in something that actually has <laughs> fixed points, strings between fixed points. So there's a standing wave that gets set up between these two points. So you can pluck a string like that. The students hear that, and they can identify perhaps a little better with a standing wave. It's still a bit of a stretch, certainly a long stretch for me to translate that into an electron orbital, but at, <laughs> least, but at least it gives us an idea of what a standing wave is like. So quite honestly, playing that one string is not very entertaining, or at least I don't think it's very entertaining, and I'm not sure the students would believe that it's very entertaining. So what you can do, especially if the students are, are interested, is turn that standing wave into a sequence of standing waves. So we can do something like this. So by having that sequence of standing waves <laughs> and understanding that we're just looking perhaps at different orbitals, you can both entertain and educate the students. Well, now we come close to the end, I think. Let's see. I was always taught never to introduce a slide because you may not really remember what the next slide is. <laughs> so, so bear with me, we'll see. We've covered three E's, right? Enthuse, engage, entertain. Oh, come on now, Jones. Change, does that begin with an E? No. no? It has an E in it, fortunately, but, <laughs> but it certainly doesn't begin with an E. And really what I'm going to talk about is change. But I so wanted that fourth E, <laughs> just for alliteration, if nothing else. And so I thought, well, let's see. We could evaluate change, but I think we do plenty of evaluation already. So instead... We're going to do embrace change. <laughs> embrace change. I think this is really true, regardless of who said it. We do get more, <laughs> we get more than one chance in our life. Generally, we get more than one chance in our life 
to make some changes. And how we adjust and adapt to that change determines whether the change is going to be successful or not. So let's listen to this. So I didn't uh, use the same refrain, but instead uh, left it as the loser now will be later to gain for the times they are changing. Because I think, at least when I was a little kid, there were times when I did feel like a loser, but I don't really feel like a loser anymore. And the times have changed. Now certainly when we talk about changes, there can be superficial changes things that really don't matter all that much. And there can be really substantive changes. And I think it's how we respond to all of these, whether they're superficial or substantive, that defines how we're going to proceed with our life. So let me give you uh, an idea of what I consider to be a rather superficial change. And that is a change in appearance. Unless you have an appearance change due to an illness of some sort. I think for the most part, you know, as we get older, our appearance changes. And it's much better than the alternative of not being around to undergo those changes. So here are some superficial changes. <laughs> Sophomore in high school in Winchester, Kansas, 1968. Seven years later. <laughs> Diana and I were married in 1975 at Shawnee Mission Park. And um, a little different appearance there. Let's see, this is a mugshot, a group photo from the University of North Dakota, the chemistry program. There I am right there. <laughs> the hairy one, yeah. Fortunately, though, look, there's a mustache, there's beard, there's a beard. I wasn't the only bearded one. Now I'm starting to look more like Norm Kalevsky with the gray, <laughs> with the gray color in the beard. But again, fairly superficial. And, and here is a very recent one, just, just from this past winter. <laughs> You can never be too safe if you're a snowman guarding somebody's house. <laughs> Bike helmet, safety goggles, a pretty important consideration. These are pretty superficial changes, okay? Pretty superficial changes. So, substantive changes. Changing from a math major to a chemistry major. Deciding in graduate school that I really wasn't suited for working in an industrial laboratory and slaving away trying to earn the almighty dollar, but instead was more suited to, at least I hope I'm more suited, to life as a teacher. Going to a, a teaching postdoc position at the University of, of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, and then moving from uh, Milwaukee to North Dakota. And my postdoctoral advisor, Dr. Kovacic, very instrumental in helping me realize that you don't have to be defined, as, as John mentioned, find out where you're supposed to be, okay? At that time in my life, this was where I was going to be because there wasn't a large job market. I had two job offers, one in Tennessee and one at North Dakota, where, by the way, you can make snowmen like this. <laughs> But I, he said to me, Marty, remember that your first job doesn't have to be your last job. It doesn't have to be your only job. 
be open to change. And if you think that what you're doing right now is not the right thing for you, then be ready to make a change. And so I did. After nine years, I thought that was a pretty fair trial for being at a PhD granting institution, supervising graduate students, writing grants and things of that sort. And it was time for me to do what I thought I was really better suited for. And I was lucky enough to get hired at Adams State College. Substantive changes. Embrace them. Have a plan if you can. A scene from Alice in Wonderland. And this has been um, rephrased by a number of people as, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. <laughs> so if you have an opportunity to make plans and to have an idea of where you're going or where you want to go, then you can change in a certain fashion, embrace that change, and plan for those changes to occur in your life. Well, I, th I think we're about done. Oh, not quite. <laughs> so we've been through four E's, or if you want, three E's and a C. <coughs> what are some of the benefits? I'm going to say to uh, a personal example, you know, the motto at Adams State College is great stories begin here. Autumn at Adams has a theme of everyone has a story to tell. So here is a person with a story to tell. Some of you may recognize this young woman. This is Leela Gonzalez, who came to Adams State College several years ago, a little unsure of what she wanted to do with her life. In her first semester at Adams State, she took introductory chemistry because she didn't think she was ready for general chemistry. She wasn't entirely sure why she was going to take introductory chemistry, but she took that. She took general biology. She took a developmental math course and a general education course of some sort. Now, this is Leela this summer in her third year of medical school at the University of Colorado going through a ceremony for the Gold Humanism Award, the Gold Humanism Honor Society, which is a select group of medical students at the University of Colorado who have not only followed their dream to enter medical school, but have been willing to do some of the things that John talked about, face their fears, embrace their changes and challenges, and to try to better the world around them. Leela volunteers at Clinica Tupayak up in Denver and a variety of other places as well. I like to think that Adams State College was a good home for Leela during the time that she was here. That our professors in all disciplines embraced change, got their students enthusiastic about learning, were willing to entertain if necessary to keep the students' attention and to educate the students, to really share their enthusiasm so that the students would also remain enthused. So Leela, I think, is an example of the benefits of the four E's because when we have more students like Leela who can do the sorts of things, and I've seen it in John's students, I've seen it in students all across campus, whether we're talking about in Plocky Hall, down to the art department, in business. We've seen these students who really can make a difference. Now I think we're done. Except for a few acknowledgments. No talk would be complete <laughs> without a few acknowledgments. So first, I'd like to thank the Autumn at Adams Committee for coming up with this great idea and for allowing John and I to, to share some time with you all tonight. I'd like to thank my wife, as John said, for Christine. I wouldn't be here standing in front of you right now if it hadn't been for Diana, because she was more than willing to adjust and adapt to all the moves that we made since we got married. 
30 years of students. John, I've managed to make it to your benchmark. <laughs> <laughs> and you will too. 30 years of wonderful colleagues at both the University of North Dakota and here, especially here at Adams State College. Dr. Dwayne Boleyn, you may recall that when I first mentioned Dr. Boleyn, it was Mr. Boleyn. Because when I had him as a teacher of chemistry, he didn't have a doctorate yet. He had a master's degree. He was teaching full-time at Emporia State. He ran a mail route, a rural route, and he was taking classes part-time at Kansas State University working toward his PhD in chemistry. He's a, I mean, he got his PhD, it was after I left, so, but I cannot imagine that he changed his enthusiasm level just by changing the initials in front of his name. He is an example of what you can do when you're really enthusiastic and really driven to succeed. Dr. Peter Kovacic, my postdoc advisor, I've already told you that he's the one who gave me that great piece of advice about first job not being your last job. What I haven't mentioned is that here now, 30 years later, I am still using some of the same techniques and same information that he showed me for the first day of class. How can you convince students on the very first day of class that chemistry is not really a scary subject, that chemistry is something which is fun and exciting and that you should be willing to study this so that you can learn something about this great world around you. 30 years later, I still use some of the information that I gleaned from Dr. Kovacic. Emporia State, University of New Mexico, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, University of North Dakota, all the schools that I was at until managing to come here to Adams State College. And this has been my home, really, for 21 years. I think many of the faculty, if you speak with them, that's how we regard this place. It is not a place to come to work. Well, sometimes it is. <coughs> but, <laughs> but it is our home, and the students and our colleagues, whether they are staff, administration, fellow teachers, they are, in fact, our family for many hours of the day. And it is a privilege to be able to have that family for this long. And with that, just one more, if you'll indulge me with just one more little piece of music here. Surely some of you recognize this. All right, so thank you very much. So again, feel free to take the candles home with you. Uh, pour the water in your cups. Adams State College. Great stories begin here.